Um, welcome to the final session of AAC 2022. Well done, you made it. So, um, and hello, hello to the viewers at home. Uh, before we start, as the last session, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we stand, the Ngunnawal and Nandri people, Nambri people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Thank you for coming today. My name's Cam. I'm a researcher at the Development Policy Centre, uh, and I'll be joined by a few colleagues here very shortly. Um, this last session, I think, uh, is going to bring together hopefully a few of the themes and find a few of the threads uh, that we've been talking about over the last couple of days. And particularly, I think, to pick up on some of the issues that the minister addressed in his uh, opening around the development of a new aid policy and the directions that may take. Um, somebody somewhere wrote something about the new aid policy being about plumbing purpose and priorities. Um, and I think we'll touch on each of those in a different way today. Uh, so first of all, on plumbing, we're going to talk about aid transparency, which is more important than it sometimes sounds. Uh, the minister said uh, yesterday that it, the new policy will address our approach to quality, transparency and accountability, and that he wanted rigorous evidence-based approaches uh, to be a key feature of the new policy. So I think transparency is going to be really important. Secondly, purpose. Um, the aid program and the new policy will have to speak to the aspirations of our partners, but also the Australian public. And so we're going to talk about what the aid program is for and what the Australian people think about the Australian aid program. And that's obviously going to be a really important part of the new policy, particularly if the new government uh, is going to perhaps gain bipartisan consensus around the new policy. So public opinion will clearly be important to that. And thirdly, priorities. Where does the money go? How do we balance the trade-offs? Um, the minister talked about a few particular areas yesterday, gender, climate, disability, First Nations. And so we're also going to be talking about some of the work that's been done around the priorities of the new aid strategy. So, who do we have? Um, we have a fantastic panel here to talk about the Australia state of Australian aid. Uh, we have Hyun Liu. Uh, Hyun is a research officer at the Development Policy Centre working in the area of economic development. She recently finished the Master's Program of International Development Economics here at the ANU and has been working also as a research consultant with the Asia Foundation on China's foreign policy. Secondly, we have Dr. Terence Wood, and you may remember Terence from this morning's cracking debate. Um, Terence is a research fellow here at the Development Policy Centre. Terence's research focuses on the domestic political economy of aid in donor countries, public opinion about aid, NGOs, aid effectiveness in poorly governed states, and Melanesian electoral politics. Prior to commencing PhD study, Terence worked for the New Zealand Aid Agency. And finally, we have Bridie, who was also a feature of this morning's cracking aid debate. Uh, Bridie is the founder and CEO of the Development Intelligence Lab. She's a collaborator, a networker, and in a former life, Bridie worked in PNG with the Attorney General's Department, and she also was director of ACF ACFID's policy and advocacy area. Most re recently, Bridie was a 2021 National Awardee of the Fulbright Scholarship in Not-for-Profit Leadership, and she is currently a non-resident affiliate with the Washington-based Center for Strategic and International Studies and the ANU's RegNet. So, without further ado, we're going to turn over first to Juan, and she's going to talk about aid transparency. Thank you. Cameron just did a terrible job pronouncing my name. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Sharon Kenning. Okay, great. 
Um, I'm very happy to be here to present to you our findings on the 2022 Australian Aid Transparency. Terence and I worked on this project together. As Terence has another paper to present, so it's just me presenting the results today. Australian Aid Transparency seeks to understand whether Australian government is consistently providing important information about the aid program and its projects. The Development Policy Center started doing this aid project from nearly a decade ago, and now it is the first time we're doing it. In line with the previous audits, we focus on a sample of 27 country and regional programs. Unlike before, this time we included a new aspect of transparency to look at the budget data. Beyond that, we continue our project transparency, um, including the project coverage and availability of basic and detailed project information. The eight budget data released around the budget night um, sorry, just briefly saying that um, because this is a very short presentation, in the rest of the presentation, I will just briefly describe about like how we ordered each of these aspects and what is the main result. For the aid budget data, it released around the budget night and it has experienced a few changes in the past. For example, during the Howard, Rudd and Gillard of government, the budget summaries were designated as ministerial statements and was published on the Treasury website as part of the formal aid budget document. Sorry, I'm getting really, really nervous. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, because of these changes, um, the aid, the quality and the size of information provided on aid budgets has changed dramatically and we were wondering whether some key information has been consistently available to the public. So we identified five key important information and scored a program based on the availability of this information. The results indicate the aid program has actually done a good job in providing timing budget information. But then in some recent years, some important aspect of information have been missing. The 2020 to 21 and 2021 to 22 summaries only contain two out of five key important information. In the latest year, in, in this year's March budget, it has actually done a better job. And for the October budget, it has done even better. However, we did this, pro, uh, we did this analysis before the October, so it is not included in this table. But in the October budget, the total sectoral estimate is provided. But then for the ODA to GNI estimate, which is a very important and a conventional measure for a country's generosity, is still not provided. Next, we move on to project transparency. We obtain our project information from the eight programs web pages for country and regional programs. And the image above on the right is an example of the web page for Solomon Islands program. Before we dive deep into the quality of information provided on individual projects, we need to understand how, how much projects that are being listed on the web pages are they covering all the projects. In addition, the DFAT has provided a list, a, a table containing projects between three to 10 million Australian dollars. This is a commendable effort. Therefore, we also calculate the project coverage after including the information from this table. Our results is shown here, um, listed by the country and the regional programs. The blue columns indicate the project coverage that is only using the information from the web pages. And the orange columns shows the additional coverage um, after including the information from the table. And for the yellow line indicates the number of projects included. So from this chart, we see that only Iraq and Tuvalu have 100% project cover rates. But then those programs are very small, each with one project only. The overall, <laughs> The overall project rate is pretty low. Only 61% of the projects are covered on the web pages. 
and even including the information from the separate table that would increase that would bring up the project coverage rate to 71 percent that's still not very high we next look at the availability of basic project information specifically we look at the availability of project description plan dates project budgets and previous financial year expenditure this type of information provides a, provides us a basic understanding of a project's purpose and size. In 2022, we look at a total of 280 projects. Figure two shows the overall score of the basic project information assessment over the years, and table two provides the details. And we can see that the aid program has done well in providing project description, plan dates, and project budgets. But then since 2016, it kind of stopped providing information on how much was spent on a project in the previous year. We still consider the overall availability of basic information as high, but then there is an important chance that the availability has deteriorated over the time and now is at its lowest level over the past decade. Lastly, we look at the availability of detailed project information. And here, we focus on four types of documentation with respect to a project cycle. That includes policy documents, uh, which outlines the aid program's approach to carry out an aid project, and the plan documents that describe how a project is undertaken, the implementation documents that report the progress, and the review documents that give us the assessment of the project. So for the result of that, we can see that the availability of detailed project information in 2022 is pretty low. And then the scores dropped in all categories except for the policy documents. We have identified some three very important patterns. The first one is that country and regional programs that was more transparent in 2019 tend to be more transparent in 2022 as well. And then projects which provide the plan documents in the early stage are more likely to provide a review documents in the later stage. And for the larger projects, they are more transparent than the smaller ones. Those patterns indicate that the project transparency is past dependent and resource dependent. In other words, fostering a culture of transparency and allocating more staff resources to a project helps uh, lead to better and continued transparency. Overall, from our findings, um, while it, it indicates some very disappointing facts about the current state of Australian aid transparency, it would be unfair to say that um, transparency is only deteriorating. We all know that there have been some many positive measures taken. However, the important message here for today is that there is an undeniable and massive deterioration in transparency. We recommend six actions that Australian governments can take to help improve the program. Most importantly, Australian governments should make a clear commitment to, um, about what it expects from the aid program and to demonstrate the political will to aid transparency. In addition, a transparency unit within DFA should be established to promote and monitor the aid transparency. Overall, I want to say we all know that aid transparency matters, but it is also important to know that it, there is an urgent need for Australia to reset Australian aid transparency now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sharon, and thank you, everyone. What I'm going to do today is speak to you all uh, very briefly about some of the findings from the eight years of research that the Development Policy Center has focused uh, on the, the Australian public's attitudes to foreign aid. Before I go any further, I want to acknowledge the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who has supported some of this research. 
I also want to acknowledge uh, some of my colleagues, including Sharon and also Ryan, who I see in the audience, who have worked on this project at various different times too. I've only got 10 minutes, uh, but the good news for you uh, is there is a discussion paper, indeed a discussion paper with quite a long abstract, and so if you want more information, you can download the discussion paper. The URL is at the bottom of this slide. The first thing you might be wondering is, well, why were you at the Development Policy Centre even interested in learning more about Australian attitudes to foreign aid? And really, our interest was st sparked by a frustrating gap that we stumbled upon when uh, we started wondering just what Australians thought about all the radical changes which occurred to the Australian aid program and aid budget between 2013 and 2015. We looked around and we didn't feel like we could find much by the way of satisfactory answers to the questions that were in our minds about just how all of this was going down with the public. So what we sort of set out to do to fill that gap was we started commissioning large nationally representative surveys of the Australian public and we started asking the Australian public all sorts of questions about their attitudes to aid. We also analysed the data from the surveys in a range of different ways. Because time is limited today, um, what I'm going to do is simply focus on aggregate findings and I'm also only going to focus on the findings from one particular question and this was the question that we asked people about their attitudes to the volume of Australian aid spending. Did people think that Australia spent too much on foreign aid, about the right amount, or too little? And let's start with some bad news for you all. When we first had a crack, of asking this, had a crack at asking this question in 2015, as you can see on the slide behind me, nearly 40% of Australians said that they thought the aid program devoted too much money to, uh, the Australian government devoted too much money to foreign aid. Only about 14% of Australians said that they thought that their government devoted too little money to foreign aid. What's more, we were able to compare these data with data from a 2011 survey run by Essential Media, which asked a very similar question, and when they asked that question in 2011, they got about the same results. So come 2015, not only did Australians seem very hostile to foreign aid, but it seemed like a, a sort of belief that they'd been holding for quite a long time. And this, I guess, begged a question, or at least sparked a question in my mind. Well, if Australians feel this way, is it possible to change their attitude by providing them with a little bit more information about foreign aid one way or another? And the first way we tried... Uh, fortunately for us, it actually turns out that it's quite easy to resolve that question simply by running something that's called a survey experiment. And what you do with a survey experiment is you have a control group in the experiment who are just asked their attitudes about foreign aid. Do they think the government gives too much, about the right amount, too little? And you have a treatment group who are provided with some additional information about foreign aid, and they are then asked their attitudes about aid spending. And by comparing responses between the treatment and the control group, you get a pretty reliable estimate of the effect of the additional information on Australians' attitudes to aid. And the first piece of information that we, I should say as a New Zealander, I tried uh, um, testing upon uh, the Australian public was one that I thought would be a no-brainer. I thought this was going to win for sure. The average Australian or the typical Australian thinks that their government devotes about 10% of federal spending to foreign aid. <laughs> the real number is 0.8%, right? And so I chuckled it, uh, to myself just a little bit and then I said, well, why don't we provide Australians with some accurate information on just how little, uh, sh uh, how, just how small a share of federal spending goes to foreign aid and surely that will change Australians' beliefs about aid volumes. I thought this one was just a clear-cut case Naturally enough, of course, I was wrong. It turned out that when you provide Australians with information on just how small their, uh, their sort of smaller sacrifice their government makes in the name of foreign aid spending, it doesn't change attitudes whatsoever. <laughs> and that, of course, uh, raised another question in my mind at least, which was, well, perhaps the Australian public is completely impervious to facts. Um, <laughs> 
However, and I'm sure this will be of relief to those of you in the audience here, it turns out that when we ran other survey experiments and tried providing different types of information uh, to the Australian public, quite often we found that the information we provided had a significant impact, particularly in reducing the share of the population who thought that Australia gave too much foreign aid. And I'm not going to summarize each and every one of these experiments now, but I'm going to tease out what I think is a fairly general lesson from the experiments that we ran and the findings that we got. And this is that when you provide the public with abstract information, such as aid as a share of federal spending, people ignore that sort of information. On the other hand, when you provide more tangible information about what specific aid projects are doing, how they're meeting a particular need, that often proves to be much more effective in changing public attitudes. And when you do that, often, at least in an experimental setting, attitudes change. Of course, that's an experimental setting. Some of you will be wondering, well, yeah, okay, Terence, what about out there in the real world? Does the public's overall attitude to Australian, does the Australian public's overall attitude to aid ever really change much over time? You just told me that it didn't change between 2011 and 2015. What about after 2015? Well, the answer to that question can be seen on this chart. And it's a chart of the results that we got from asking Australians the same question over time. Simple question, do you think your country gives too much, too little, or about the right amount of aid? And it shows you the annual results. The orange line is the share of the population who said that their country gives too much foreign aid. The blue line down the bottom is the share of the population who thinks that their country gives too little foreign aid. Does this work? Ah, uh, yeah. And what you'll notice, let's just have a look at the orange line, is that from 2011 to 2019, it doesn't really change much at all. Over that period of time, Australians' attitudes to aid remained remarkably consistent and basically remarkably hostile. Then, all of a sudden, I could give this talk on New, Zealand, uh, New Zealanders and it would be as depressing, please. So this isn't a comment <laughs> on Australians, all right? Um, come 2019, or between 2019 and 2020, all of a sudden, the share of the population who says that Australia gives too much foreign aid starts to fall very rapidly. And at the same time, we see a steady growth in the share of the population who thinks that Australia gives too little foreign aid. And the change is such that once we get to 2022, when we ran the survey this year, the share of the population in the too much category is effectively about the same as the share of the population in the not enough category. So all of a sudden, this sort of stubborn, stubbornly consistent hostility to aid falls away. Well, something akin to support for increasing the aid budget rises fairly rapidly too. That obviously begs another question, which is, well, what changed? What happened? What, was, uh, what occurred which shifted Australian public attitudes to foreign aid? And I go into this in quite some detail in the discussion paper. I'm not going to get into too much of that detail at this point in time, because we can answer that question fairly simply just by looking at the dates across the bottom here. Can anyone remember if something <laughs> significant... <laughs> you can't? <laughs> All right, so yeah, COVID-19. And I point to a range of evidence that suggests that COVID-19 probably played a very important role in changing the attitudes that the Australian public has to foreign aid. One way or another, COVID-19 both convinced some Australians of the need for development assistance in other countries and convinced other Australians that we do all live on this planet together and that if they ignore problems elsewhere, they might find they're also in Melbourne too very quickly, right? <laughs> so COVID-19 seems like the most likely explanation for this radical change in Australian attitudes to foreign aid. And if you're someone like me who supports foreign aid, that's a pretty happy picture. Unfortunately, I can't guarantee to you that these trends will continue going into the future. But the one thing that we can say for certain right now is that attitudes to aid amongst the Australian public do seem to be quite flexible. They can shift over time. 
And that is where I'm going to leave us right now. I will leap back to advertise the discussion paper again, though. The discussion paper has statistical appendices which ought to satisfy both economists and political scientists, but the paper itself is written in an engaging and simple manner. <laughs> and oh, what did I say, right? <laughs> Anyhow, you'll enjoy reading it, I promise. <laughs> and so I've actually got appendix slides which we can get into in question time if you have particularly probing questions. Otherwise, thank you very much for your attendance. And, uh, <laughs> please don't forget the discussion paper. Thanks, Terence. Um, I'll take the discussion paper first and see how I go with the uh, appendices thereafter. <laughs> Good eye. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, what a privilege to be here. And I have to say, it's an absolute career highlight um, to be at this panel with such a remarkable um, group of people from DevPol, whose work I've admired for so long, um, and also with all of you, particularly those sitting on the steps. Good job. Um, great to see the commitment there. Um, what I'm going to talk to you through today is some work that we've been doing at the lab to inform the new development policy or what I would call the new development strategy. The difference being a policy sets direction at a very high level. The strategy tells us also how to get there and we'll come back to this. I'm going to walk you through this discussion in three parts. All right, I'm going to start with what is happening right now when it comes to the consultation on Australia's new development policy. And I'm going to put to you that policy is the art of the imperfect. All right, and they then want to move into what's going to happen next. Once the consultation closes, get your submissions in today. I've heard that extensions are a bit tricky. And what's going to happen next is that it's going to be time for some really, really tough choices. And then once those choices are made and a policy comes out the other end by mid next year, I want to talk about the future, which is that there is no policy success without addressing some really key challenges and really focusing down on implementation. So let's talk about what's happening right now. About two kilometres from here, maybe 1.8, depending on where you're standing in Crawford, there is a team sitting inside the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and they've got a blank page in front of them. Well, we hope it's blank at this point because they're still consulting, right? And at the top, somebody has written in a beautiful scrawl, Australia's new development policy because they didn't take my advice about strategy. <laughs> and they've given themselves a little bit of calm because they've put 2023 on it, not 2022. This is not a rush job. <laughs> and my best guess back at the, cal the envelope calculations, not in an appendix, sorry, is that they're going to be grappling with anywhere up to about 800 submissions. That was a number that came in last time DFAT ran this process. All right, they're going to be grappling with at least, we heard from the minister yesterday, 30 stakeholder roundtable discussions, maybe more. Of course, every single post, over 20 of them, will be consulting bilaterally with government partners as well as with communities and other development stakeholders, and that's without thinking about consulting across DFAT and government about what this new development policy must entail. And that team inside DFAT is going to be asking themselves, how do I take all of this information and determine what matters most? And what we know about submissions is that people write them often on behalf of an organisation with the wonders and the limits that that have, and what we know about roundtables is often the loudest person in the room speaks, often the male speaks first as well. All right, so this is a really, really tough consultation job that's going on right now. And this is what they're hearing, all right? A bit like what we've been hearing the last couple of days, okay? They're hearing about climate change, water and energy systems, solidarity in the Pacific, a lot of localization, more localization, decolonization, technology, entrepreneurial growth, gender, managing contractors, NGOs as well, private sector. I mean, are you guys getting overwhelmed here? Just, just reading this list, all right? This list reflects 
you in this room. These are words that have come out of the panels over the last couple of days, all right? These are the things that are critical to our hearts and minds as development professionals. But the message that these policy makers are receiving is that everything is important. And with my former organisational consultant hat on, if I walked into an organisation and they gave that to me and said, this is what we do, I'd be in panic. I'd say, let's sit down with the board and let's just talk about what is most essential here. What are the priorities? But this is a deeply uncomfortable thing to do. It's a deeply uncomfortable thing to do for us and for government as well. So, one thing we know, and we know this because of every independent review over the last 40 years, we know this innately because we know we can't run organisations without priority and focus. Choices must be made. And the failure to make choices in a new development strategy, the failure to focus it, directly results quite often in ineffective development. We can't do it all well. So as a think tank, we are absolutely obsessed by how we can better inform these imperfect policy processes, right? So we were talking inside and we we're saying, we've got this new development strategy coming. We know that there are gonna be critical choices to be made. We know that there are divergent views about what matters most, and we don't want to just surface them, we wanna test and prioritize them as well. So we got together 50 regional experts, their names are up there on the page. We got together 50 Australian experts too. The 50 on the left look bigger than the 50 on the right because their organisations are on the page as well. But trust me, it's about 50-50 here. And I think you'd agree with me and a lot of them are in this room today. It's a pretty authoritative lot of regional and Australian development experts. And what I'm going to share with you today, we've released in very preliminary form on our website, but I'm going to share just a couple of the key insights that we generated. All right, so one question we asked them was, what Australian interests does the development program best advance? And what we saw was a list from one to five, this is in order, of the interests that our Australian development community thought that the new development strategy and Australian development best advance. So we've got security and stability related interests, regional relationships and international influence, third was economic prosperity, fourth a rules-based order, fifth open civic space and democracy. But not everything can matter. So we said, right guys, now you've got 100 points, you're in the hot seat. Please allocate your points according to which national interests the development program should advance. Now, this is very preliminary analysis. Unlike Terence, who's been at it for years, the time between announcement of the policy and today is less than six weeks, all right? So this is preliminary analysis we've got here. And what we saw was a flipping of the order. Our experts said security and stability first, but when given 100 points, they said no, no, no. The Australian interest that the development program best advances is our interest in a region with open civic space, good governance, accountability, democratic governance as well. They also saw almost on par the ability for Australia to advance our interest in regional relationships and international influence. Now, two things of note here. I don't necessarily think we should read this as security being bottom of the pile. We asked everybody why they allocated the points the way that they went. And one emerging theory is that our development experts are saying one of the best ways to advance stability in the region is through investing in open civic space, democracy, governance and accountability. Also of interest, I think, is that if we had run this survey a couple of years ago, I think there would have been much greater discomfort around the development program being used to advance regional relationships and international influence. But when we dive into what people are saying and how they're allocating those points, they're not, they are distinguishing, for example, between using a development program to transact and purchase influence with elites, which is not what most of our experts are saying, versus recognising just how critical regional relationships are to development, 
how Australia needs to play a role advocating for the Pacific Islands in multilateral fora, for example, or just how critical relationships are as an enabling force behind development impact as well. We then ask them what are the top five strengths, and I'm only going to skip through one or two more of these. And how would you capitalise on these strengths? Because a good policymaker will want to safeguard what we do well and perhaps drop or work on what we don't. We saw here that the Australian experts saw our cooperation and our connection as a really key strength, our shared history, our ability to engage with our Pacific family, the non-paternalistic Pacific family version, that is. Interestingly, they ranked quality out of those top five last. And when we spoke to our regional experts, we saw the inverse. Our regional experts said the number one strength of Australian development is the quality of the assistance provided. But where we have the most improvement to go is on the way that we cooperate and our ability to be flexible. <laughs> now, Madeline Flint, who's sitting over here, who led a lot of this research, warned me that you'd laugh at this point <laughs> and said to me, I need to also warn you. We don't know if that is a completely inverse relationship. One possibility is that Australia is not seeing itself clearly, right? We think we're great at cooperating and we're not. It's not that simple. Our Australian experts were also really concerned about a level of paternalism in the Australian aid program. We do wonder if perhaps our Australian experts took it for granted that we were investing in a little bit of quality. That's research that we need to unpack over the next couple of months, hopefully with a few of you guys. All right, what should we stop doing? And what is most important to stop doing? Now, what we expected to hear as a result here was things like perhaps, perhaps we should be doing less infrastructure, more gender assistance. Perhaps we should be doing more people-to-people -people assistance. We expected a, a list of modalities to come out here. <coughs> but on the tops of the minds of the Australian experts of things to stop, was this, it was a value statement. <laughs> Our experts were saying that over the last few years they are feeling to some extent that as an Australian development program, not just the official development program, but as a program writ large, we're not valuing our expertise enough and not only are we not valuing Australian expertise, but we are not most importantly in valuing the country expertise the capacity and the capability of local leaders on the ground who are leading development outcomes. So that was just a taster and um, we had 12 uh, questions and a heck of a lot of qualitative data that we'll be unpacking over the next month or two and releasing in January, so please stay tuned. Um, but looking very, very briefly to the future, once these tough choices have hopefully been made, because remembering we can't do it all, we can't do it all well. We need focus to a new development strategy. We will be onto the job mid next year of addressing the known challenges and implementation of a new policy. And something that we did at the lab to help that, it, again, led by Madeline, supported by Richard Moore over here, is that we did a review of reviews. We ripped through the 1984 Jackson Review, the 1997 Simons Review, the 2004 Core Group Review, the 2011 Independent Review as well. And we asked the question, what are the four most persistent challenges that must be overcome in Australian development? And this is the brief result. Again, a very well written discussion paper will be live soon. And the first result, right, the first big challenge that we think the development policy must address and overcome is naming the motivations of Australian development. It is no longer tenable to say Australian development is about soft power relations and influence, as well as being about infrastructure. We're also about human development. We're also about ooh, various other regions, maybe a Security Council bid, enter China. These are multiple, multiple motivations behind development. And I think what we've heard over the last couple of days is that clarity on the motivation behind development is going to be critical to how Australia is received and also the impact that we can have in the region. The second we've covered is the persistent inability to focus 
the program on where we can deliver results is directly contributing to ineffectiveness, all right? Again, coming from the reviews. We've then seen from the reviews a consistent challenge in translating policy to practice, which is why we advocate a strategy, not just a policy, all right? And then, of course, again, the fourth finding from this review of the reviews is that we can do better in capitalising on the development ecosystem, all the amazing people who are sitting here today. So at the lab, we're certainly interested in what's going to happen in the next couple of uh, months as the development policy process unfolds. I think it's fair to say that we'll be looking not only for the way that the development strategy addresses these four things, but in particular on the implementation front, we'll be looking for a level of roadmap or some sort of plan that shows us how these overarching focus and policy settings are going to translate into different practice in the region. We'll also be looking closely at the very, very powerful process of country planning. That is the moment where we take these overarching policy settings and we say, what does Australia stand for with our partners in the region, country by country, project by project, budget allocation by budget allocation. And one of our preliminary conclusions is that it might just be time for a new independent assessment and operational review of the Australian Development Program. The last one was 2011. We understand why now there is just a policy process underway, but within the next couple of years, it would be a great time to have a really good hard look at what is working and what is not in Australian development. But right now, thank you very much, um, and it's been an exciting couple of days. Thank you. That was terrific. Um, we don't have particularly long for questions because we have to get underway with 3MAP shortly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask if there's... Uh, I'm going to go for three questions in this room and I'm going to go for two questions in Western. So can I get um, uh, any questions firstly from this room? Yes, please, Nandita first. Yep. I think one of the things that was there in your slide was flexibility and quality, as flexibility being number two and quality at five. Um, flexibility comes with its risk. Do you see a correlation between flexibility and quality in terms of organizations' ability to deliver flexibly and deliver with quality? That's a great question. Um, I think that it's always interesting in these discussions, um, and particularly in the qualitative research that we've done, to understand that people fly at different levels. So for some uh, of our regional leaders in particular, when they were saying there is a lack of flexibility, they were talking about a rigidity in funding approvals, um, a level of accountability or control from the donor, for example. That's very different to when I speak to a politician about the need for flexibility in the development program. Um, so I, I think it would be false um, at this stage for us to be saying there's a correlation or a conflict between um, flexibility and quality. But I certainly know that there is pressure out there, for example, um, if you were using a development program to be motivated by security concerns. My word, you, there are people saying to Australia, hurry up on your infrastructure, get out there and deliver faster. Um, and that is going to put that issue of quality and flexibility in, in direct conflict. Um, so I think that there's potential for that conflict, but I think in our results, when, when our people were saying um, we need to be more flexible and also you know, maintain the high quality of the Australian aid program, they were saying we need to be flexible to opt for opportunities to build on greater you know, as, as opportunities present to adapt on development more than this sort of transactional uh, flexibility. So I think it differed between the Australian and Pacific. Another question from the room? Ryan? Yes. Thank you, guys. I'll throw a question at Bridie. There was one word that didn't pop up that surprised me throughout the talk of many potential priorities, and that was poverty. Is your sense from talking to the experts that no one cares about that anymore? Has it fallen out of favour? Whether the SDGs, where do, what's going on there? Thanks. 
Thank you. Um, we were absolutely shocked by that as well. Um, and I don't know what to make of it. So uh, previously, for example, when I was standing at a diplomatic academy and giving you know, a speech to grads many moons ago, and the first thing I said to them is, right, what do you associate development to? I had to actually come up with the idea of poverty, right? It's been a dirty word for a while um, in a lot of circles, I think, here in Canberra. Um, I think it would be unfair to say that it didn't come up at all amongst our development experts. Their focus was a little bit more on inequality, for sure, um, but the poverty analysis was certainly there. It was just gripped up more in an inequality category, uh, for sure. Human development was the other frame that they used a lot. So. I think it exists. I, I wouldn't read into poverty not being an issue for development experts by any stretch. Um, but I was, I was pretty shocked, I think, at the economic growth being, say, the third potential interest that the development program serves. I think we are seeing a, a shift to the social, political, leadership -y space of development across the experts. Yes. Do we have another question from here in Malonglu? Thanks, everyone. Um, I have a question also about purpose. Um, Terence, would you mind sharing us with us a little bit or a sneak preview of what the Australian public thought the purpose of Australian aid is? I'm just curious to see how that might compare with the experts surveyed in Bridie's survey. So we frame the question in a different way so they're not directly comparable. And the purpose question is actually a little challenging because results Responses change quite a lot uh, depending on the way the question is worded. However, overall, we found that when we asked Australians, would you prefer Australian aid primarily be focused on helping people in developing countries or primarily be focused on advancing Australian interests? The majority of people said helping developing countries. So the sort of fixation with the nat national interest seems to be something that uh, primarily exists here in you know, Canberra policy circles, whereas amongst the Australian public, uh, there are more altruistic sentiments, it would seem, that dri drive people's desire for aid to be given. Did you want to say something? Bridget, um, it might just be worth clarifying. Oh, our results were not in relation to asking people what the purpose of the development program should be. Ours was specifically on what national interests <laughs> Do, does the program advance? And we wouldn't see national interests versus, say, regional interests as binary. We would be talking about the national interests in supporting the development of countries in the region. Yeah. Terrific. Um, so I might have to go now to our colleagues in Western. Um, I'm going to beam over to the other side of the building. Do we have any questions from people in Western? Thanks, Cam. Can you oh. hear us? Uh, it's a little quiet. Maybe okay, um, there, Michael there Wilson go. from yep. eWater. Um, I'm going to cheat and have two very brief questions oh, to Mike. two of the panellists. Um, firstly, to Terence, around um, public opinion. It's not a public opinion is not a fixed thing. It changes um, as a result of leadership. And the minister, in his address, gave us a few clues about building support for the aid program. I just wonder in your methodology whether you've asked the questions around what would change your opinion if you have a negative opinion about the volume of aid? What are the sorts of things that would make people more amenable? And then to Bridie, um, the, the question I suppose that Richard Moore raised in the panel session the other day around selectivity, places and things. Well, we've been reasonably selective around places because we've had a focus on the Indo-Pacific fairly clearly for, for the last decade and more. But what about things? Do we still think that Australia can be equally good as a development partner across every development sector? Or should we be should we be being more selective about that? What, what did the survey tell us about those, those sorts of issues? So we'll go to, um, I might just ask, is there any 
Do we have another question from Weston while we're there? Or? Okay, well, Michael got two anyway. So um, we'll go to you, Terence, first on that public opinion question and then to Brady. So, no, we never asked people what would change your opinion. We didn't think we'd get very useful answers from that. What we did instead was test using survey experiments the different types of information that seemed to be most effective in changing people's opinions. And we ran a lot of survey experiments. I summarized the overarching findings from those experiments very quickly in the middle of the talk. Uh, but the results are in more detail than the paper. Certainly some types of information, some sort of relevant facts about aid do seem to change Australians' opinions about aid. And so perhaps there is indeed a role for leaders to get those facts out into the public more proactively. Thanks, Michael. Um, you know, thankfully, we had Richard Moore on the on the team, so he was pushing this question pretty hard for us. Um, the results, though, were fascinating, and this is probably the key reason why we haven't re uh, released them yet. It's because I think we need to disaggregate it. So when we said to people, what should the focus of the development program be, of course, our proposition being that we do need to narrow the focus. We can't keep doing everything all at once with a very, very finite set of resources. What we sort of expected to see was trends or choices, and that's not what we saw. Instead, what we've discovered, I think, is a spectrum of world views underpinning our development experts. And what we need to go back and check and validate, um, but what our in initial instinct is, is that, for example, if you see the primary purpose of development being to uh, to solve the poverty challenges and the vulnerability challenges of particularly vulnerable communities, then you will be drawn towards doing the things, Michael, that look more like supporting grassroots organisations, um, working sub-nationally, looking at disability organisations, right? And this is really critical, legitimate work. If you see the primary purpose of an Australian development program as catalyzing economic growth, well then you are going to be wanting to do the things that look like aid for trade, macroeconomic policy, perhaps social protection work as well. If you are Stefan Durkin and you believe that development, your worldview is that development comes from a critical elite compact and commitment to catalyzing development that can only come from elite leaders in a country, then you are going to be investing heavily in that governance realm, all right, in the incentives and the institutions that might give rise to that leadership of a developing nation. So what we're seeing, Michael, is actually no answer right now on the things we should be doing. But what I would love is a government that was bold enough a government that was bold enough to say, this is not either or, don't pit ourselves against each other, those that care most about grassroots and those that care most about rule of law and governance. Quit that and let's look country by country at what Jackie DeLacy said yesterday. What are the greatest development risks in this country? How and where is Australia best placed to support them? And then make a choice about what the things are that we're going to do and make a choice about the balance of investments that we're going to have. So, sorry, Michael, no answer on um, what the focus question should be, but my gosh, we've got an opportunity to actually unpack that and come back next year and have a much more sophisticated conversation um, about all of our mental models behind the development program. Terrific. Um, yeah, so as Bridie said, just briefly, the, today is the last day, I think, for submissions for the new policy, so get them in if you haven't already. Um, <laughs> yep. Uh, Terence and I have authored one, which will be published soon. Um, but yeah, and I think that po that points about um, uh, agnosticism sometimes about sectors uh, and looking at the countries that you're working in and what those challenges are, I think is a really important one and one that did come up in the 2011 review. Um, we're going to now move to the more exciting... Oh. <laughs> Beth. <laughs> no, well, no, no just as exciting, 
uh, segment, the three map, which I think you've all been waiting for. We have a wonderful trophy stashed away somewhere. So without further ado, we're going to do a quick transition and Beth's going to run the three map. So thanks to the panel. Please don't leave. Can you turn the microphone on? Where are you going? Where are you going? We're not finished. Hello, hello. Don't leave. Where are you going? <laughs> we haven't finished. Oh, well. Oh, miss. Whoa, yeah. Okay. So we're now going to do a very smooth segue into 3MAP, the three minute aid pitch, which is, we're very excited to be bringing this back to AAC after a few years of pause. Uh, so this is how it's going to work. We've got seven presenters. Each presenter will have three minutes and we're going to be hardcore about that. Once they, we get to the three minutes and there'll be a ticking sound, how daunting, for the last 15 seconds. Feel free to be calm. And even if they're mid-sentence, they will have to stop. <laughs> Some of them will have presentations. And at the end of the seventh presentation, I hope you've all been actively using your conference app, we'll bring up the audience vote, and you'll have two minutes to vote. But importantly, I need to acknowledge Development Intelligence Lab, who are supporting this session of the conference. Someone will get this trophy to put in the bathroom like they do the Oscars or wherever. Okay, so let's get into it, shall we? Our first presenter is Lao Tua Falatau from Deloitte. Please come. Yeah. Woo, woo, woo. Good afternoon, everyone. Maloi Lele, my name is, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Lautor Faletau. I'm originally from the Kingdom of Tonga, and I now call Australia home. <laughs> After the Mitchell oration, keynote address by my learned colleague, Ofaki Lebuka Gutenberg-Likiliki, I quickly went home. She challenged us and left us with many things to ponder. And overnight, I added to the title of my pitch, which now reads, Engaging the Pacific, the Art of Listening. <laughs> this afternoon, I offer you perspectives. I don't offer you an app or a new methodology. <laughs> I offer you perspectives based on my lived experience, both as the Tongan law enforcement officer on the receiving end of aid, and for the past 16 years as a development practitioner working for Australia's National Police Agency, delivering development assistance to Pacific Police Agencies. As I said before, I don't have an app or a fancy product. Just a few questions to frame and guide our engagement with our Pacific partners. Much has been said at this conference about localization, from defining it as best practice, practical examples of how it's worked in the delivery of aid, and we often hear of taglines like, by the Pacific for the Pacific, Pacific solutions for Pacific issues. But isn't it ironic that the concept has only really become a reality when the world shut down due to COVID-19? <laughs> I personally don't use localization. I prefer using what I believe is a better description of a perfect partnership, locally led and owned. <laughs> Today, I would like to offer you a few questions, and I would like to frame it in the life cycle of the capability development program, which I delivered for many years with the AFP. In the conceptualization or initial engagement stage, during the high-level talks to set priorities, I think it is critical that we chart a way forward by asking, who does this impact the most and are they invited to the table? 
and more importantly, to ask our partners, what does good look like to you? What outcomes are you after and what does success look like for both of us? At the design development stage, we need to ask ourselves, are we creating safe spaces for our Pacific partners to lead, create and innovate and, in, and is this reflected in our program designs and implementation plans? Co-creation and co-delivery, I believe, can only work if the power dynamic is shifted to having a Pacific-led approach. How are we ensuring Pacific leadership in our programs? In lead, are they in lead decision-making roles? Our next presenter. <laughs> hey, you, you, time's up. Yeah, no, no, you're right. Our next presenter is Clay O'Brien. Come up, Clay, and they'll let you know when to start. Um, yeah. Impact investment. Sounds like a contradiction in terms. We all want development outcomes, but how can that be achieved through investment? Well, there's a lot of evidence now to show that measurable and positive environmental and social outcomes can, can be achieved while generating financial returns. And this is not a new concept. Microfinance institutions were attracting social capital 25 years ago. But now it's expanded and it and uh, impact investment is being attracted by sectors such as renewable energy, uh, food and agriculture, education, and healthcare. And after spectacular growth in the last four years, it's now estimated that the impact investment market is some one trillion US dollars, which is about five times ODA. But even if you add those two together, there's still a lot more to be done. If we're gonna reach the SDG goals, we need another three billion of financing. So where is that going to come from? As, the, as impact investing has grown, it's become more complicated. So now you have very large funds that are being generated. You have, uh, uh, you have much more sophistication needed in terms of the documentation. You also have a whole range of people who have to get involved. Shareholders, governance bodies, different ranges of investments, and very expensive uh, advisors. So where does this leave the NGOs? Out in the wilderness, frankly. <laughs> but these are the good guys, right? These are the ones where impact is part of their DNA. It's not something they describe on page 50 of a prospectus. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, Aidan and Brightlight have been working on a concept, an NGO master trust fund. Essentially, this would be an independent white label fund through which NGO donors and other investors could support SDG-focused impact projects. And that support could come in terms of either equity, debt, sometimes coupled with technical assistance or grants. And we've consulted widely. We've talked to a range of NGOs, also PAFs and other investors. And there's a real demand for a low-cost way for NGOs to access uh, investment uh, impact investment for their SDG focused projects. And also they want to keep it simple. They also want to make sure that their brand equity is protected. And also they want to see opportunities for revenue generation. And from the investor's point of view, it's an opportunity for them to get exposure to a range of projects, including those that are managed by, uh, managed by uh, NGOs. So we're looking to bring other people into the loop on this very exciting initiative. So please reach out to Aiden. Just made it. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Bianca Gay. Welcome, Bianca. Many of you 
this room will have had to work before in a consortium. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. Look, partnering is hard, and that's okay. Organizations are made up of people, and relationships between people are always messy, and that doesn't mean they're not worth having. Here are three takeaways, courtesy of my therapist, that may help. <laughs> One, be vulnerable enough to let your partner pleasantly surprise you. Like in dating, we all have biases in this sector. Things like managing contractors are all money-hungry carpet baggers, NGOs are a bunch of white saviors. But if you're not able to see past these labels to the people you're actually working with and be consistently vulnerable enough to let them either show up for you or disappoint you, the partnership can only grow so strong. In our sector, giving a chance could be as simple as saying, we'll be honest, disability inclusion is not really our strength, but we feel like we could learn a lot from you if you're willing to help us. Giving chances doesn't guarantee that your partner will show up for you, but not doing so guarantees that they won't because they can't. Two, make requests for what you need from a partner without assigning blame. There is a tried and tested way that is to make requests that is most likely to get what you want without putting your partner on the defense. It goes like this. When? I feel, because I need, <laughs> would you be willing to? Let's do a practice run. <laughs> when it's silent after I tell an unfunny joke, I feel deep shame because I desperately need validation from strangers. <laughs> would you be willing to fake laugh for me? <laughs> or in the context of our sector, a partner might say, when we, as the local partner, have to constantly report on our progress, but not the other way around, we feel disheartened because we need trust in order to do our best work. Would you be willing to change the process so we're both just giving each other updates? Three, it takes two to tango, but only one to break a negative cycle. You've probably all been in partnerships before which have broken down, not due to a flaw in the design or the approach, but due to communication. What you experienced then was the negative cycle. Like in dating, we all bring to our temperaments, triggers, and the models of conflict we've developed since early childhood into work, which affect these cycles. Getting trapped in them distracts us from the real resolution of what's at the heart of the disagreement. And in our sector, what you disagree on might be really important. Unless it's about formatting reports, in which case, just let it go. <laughs> uh, the good news is it only takes one partner drawing attention to the cycle and being vulnerable to break it. And that can be you. Invite your partner to be on the same side, fighting these cycles together and fighting global inequality together, which is the point, after all, of all this gathering. Thank you. <laughs>
This means that in areas where we've been working even for a really long time, we're not always able to draw on a full evidence base or history when designing or reviewing, which is even more shonky if the evidence base is a bit light on to begin with. <laughs> While a large amount of institutional knowledge no doubt holds the dreams of DFAT staffers and aid workers alike, it makes me wonder how many times we've reinvented the wheel or had to relearn a learning we should have already learned, or taken the time um, to, of, up of partners in country to ask them things they've already told us repeatedly. <laughs> it's bad for effectiveness, it's bad for value for money, it's a weird form of gatekeeping that runs counter to all these messages about openness and good governance, and it seems like a waste. I mean, the internet, it's got unlimited storage, you know? <laughs> Somehow, we now treat knowledge as if it's ephemeral. So, a few ways we can do better. Uh, fix the website, do the transparency. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's so much that should be online, just doesn't make it there. Make it easier to put stuff on the website. Um, consider using or investing in systems like regional research repositories. Uh, ensure that knowledge retention and transition is part of project completion plans, particularly for contractor programs, and resource teams to do this, externally and internally. How about a transparency and knowledge management officer in each DFAT branch, for example? <laughs> So that's it, that's the pitch. <laughs> make it accessible. Yes, we need more data and evaluation, but we also need to make sure we're not wasting what we've already done. Thank you. This is so exciting. Um, our fifth picture is Raphael Merckx. Three, two, one, start. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Raphael. I've got a background in software engineering, and then over time I became an aid worker. And one thing that's like impossible to miss when you enter the world of aid is how jargon is absolutely everywhere. So there's all these words like capacity building, multi-stakeholder collaboration, like they come over and over again, and if you use them, you seem like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, now, when you're a technologist and you see repetition, you think automation. Uh, so what I did a few months ago, <laughs> I wrote some code that downloaded a couple thousand uh, reports from the DFAT website, and um, you can see a word cloud of all of the words in these reports here. And I set out to teach an AI how to write in the style of DFAT. Um, <laughs> So you can see the result here, it's online, it's called Talk Defect to Me, I, I like the name a lot. Uh, you <laughs> so you give your report a title and then it expands on a paragraph and at least at the paragraph level it works relatively well. So, you, you might look at this and feel like, oh this is awesome, you know, like computers can now write almost like a human. But the way I look at this is like, this is awful. Like, this is not, this is not how the aid language should look like in the first place. Um, and I think there's three reasons why this is awful. So the first one is uh, transparency. Essentially, we've, we've started using all of this jargon that is constantly adding this veneer of knowledge um, that is actually saying very little. And we're using all of these terms that are ap applicable everywhere, but they convey very little meaning. The second reason is accessibility or access. So, like the vast majority of the populations that we're addressing are not native English speakers, and there's no ways that they can understand any of the things that we're writing. <laughs> um, and the third reason, which I think is the most important one, is by, by doing this, we're kind of favoring this privileged class of people who are like the aid veterans. So people who, in our region, you know, like they sit in their home in Canberra or Sydney, and you could give them a report to write about health in Vanuatu or education in Indonesia, and they can write the report. And meanwhile, you might have a local citizen in Vanuatu or Indonesia who knows a lot about the context, the history, the power dynamics, the governance of, say, education or health, but because they don't know what, what are the terms to use to satisfy the donor, they might not be your next you know, a team leader or a report writer. Um, so that's about it. I hope I've convinced you that aid jargon <laughs> is... <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That is more pernicious than you think. And um, yeah. 
I hope you think twice about this before you put a bunch of jargon in your next haircut. Thank you. Just wiping away my tears of laughter. <laughs> wow, this is exactly how I wanted to feel at this last session. Thank you. On the ball. <laughs> Melody Zavala. So how does this work? You just start like that. Okay. Three. Oh. <laughs> I'm ready. Yeah, three, two, <laughs> one, start. How can aid improve development policy? I say by investing in children's storybooks. Okay, I know this sounds simplistic in the face of global threats like uh, closing civic space and climate change, but stick with me. Our species has always used storybooks to pass culture on to our children and to inspire them. Beautifully crafted stories uh, stick with us long beyond our formative years. They really shape how we interact with the world as adults and decision makers. Nowadays, books can be freely accessible to more kids than ever we ever imagined possible. So let's use stories to enable uh, children everywhere to see themselves as problem solvers and uh, peacemakers in their daily lives and to inspire them to become the global uh, citizens, the development practitioners, and policy makers that we need. Recently, a story called My Hero Is You accomplished something like this. Um, in this, an imaginary creature helped children disseminate information about COVID-19 and how to care for one another to uh, their friends and families. And this has been one of the most translated storybooks ever. It's been adapted into more than 140 languages, into puppetry, videos, animations, you name it. In just two years, this story was experienced by and influenced millions. So let's face it, we've not done the best of jobs uh, making development work intelligible and attractive to adult taxpayers, much less to kids. So let's uh, inspire them with stories and that help convey the core concepts of shared community, uh, equal opportunity, self-determination, and uh, where am I? <laughs> um, and so using this, um, you know, these aren't these core co tenants. These are not the uh, tenants that are making the actions that we take that are not making the headlines and not inspiring the next generation to join us. So let's try another approach. Let's blend uh, local stories and regional perspectives together and get them to kids everywhere. And the stories I have in mind, kids will solve, uh, will go encounter problems in their communities and they will solve them together. In their problem-solving journeys, they will be guided by community groups, by talented local development practitioners, by humanitarians. And in these stories, kids everywhere will see themselves as heroes, something that inspires every kid. One way or another, there is a future. So let's use stories to pass a culture of uh, global citizenship onto our kids and equip our future leaders with the problem-solving approaches needed to address these issues like politics and um, environmental resilience. So creating children's storybooks to improve development policy might seem like a simple idea, but it's got to be part of the solution. Remember, it's the simple ideas that are often the most effective. And our final picture, Neil Forster. I'm good. Three, two, one, start. Okay, I do have to take a moment to check that there's no one here who's uh, paying my bills at the moment. <laughs> so um, let's, uh, let's, um, let's imagine for a moment that we've got a hospital, a bunch of hospitals, and nobody at the hospital actually knows if any of the patients are getting better. Well, they're actually not reporting whether the patients are getting better. There's lots of reporting on the budget of the hospital, of the new buildings at the hospital, of the, the salaries of the doctors and nurses, of the quality of the canteen food. But there's nothing on the patients. It's pretty strange, isn't it? Imagine also that everyone in the hospital gets together every year to talk about how to improve the hospital. 
and nobody agrees on anything much. <laughs> the only thing they agree on is that basically everything's fine and that the hospital needs more money. <laughs> Does this remind you of anything? <laughs> it's the Australian Aid Program. <laughs> Okay, not the whole Australian aid program. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like to think maybe about 85% of the Australian aid program, what I'd like to call the great unwashed part of the Australian aid program, the sort of twilight zone of the Australian aid program, where you don't get any reporting on change. You don't get any reporting on whether people, communities, institutions have actually improved because of the aid program. What do you get? You get lots of talk about budgets. You get lots of talk about how much training's gone on. You get lots of talk about how many widgets have been purchased. But there's nothing about people. So, do you think that's a bit odd, a bit strange? I, I certainly do. So I think there needs to be a couple of major reforms. So, the first one from 1st of January next year, we are going to ban the reporting of naked aid results. What do I mean by naked aid results? I mean results which don't actually talk about people. They talk about widgets and training and just how about how everyone is feeling. But there's no actual change reporting that occurs. The second thing that we're going to start from next year, which will be compulsory, is that everyone who receives aid funding actually has to have a change section in their report, where they actually report about whether anyone's actually benefited from the aid program. Let's just give another round of applause for all our pitchers. Okay, I've just been advised that the audience vote is now live on the app and I'd like to invite Maddie Flint from Development Intelligence Lab just to, uh, as a thank you for supporting this really lively session and to talk about the lab and their work. It should be on the messages session section of the app. You should be able to see the polling in the messages section. Can everyone see? Oh, great. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we'll wait just a bit before the break. And they're all going to sit chatting. Yeah, yeah, whatever you like. Yeah. Thanks. This is a, like a work in progress. Can you see this? Can you see this? Sorry. Oh, so can you bring up that list that you've got printed out? Oh, I love this one. How long have we got left? How's everyone going? Has everyone voted? Has anyone not voted? Do you need help? Okay. Can you maybe do your, you can say it now and I'll write. Yeah, can you get that piece of paper? Oh, yeah. 
15 seconds. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Do you want to yeah. speak now? Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to keep my reflections super, super brief because I know we want to hear the winner and then get outside in the sunshine now that it's made an appearance. Um, one of the reasons why the Development Intelligence Lab was so excited to sponsor this session is because we very strongly believe that identifying problems in aid and exploring them is only one piece of the puzzle, and the much more difficult piece of the puzzle is finding solutions to those problems. Um, it's been a bonus for us all today that everyone has done it in a hilarious and entertaining <laughs> manner, so for that, I thank you. Um, uh, if you'll bear with me two seconds, um, just a couple of things about the lab. Uh, we run a couple of platforms to explore these issues. If you're interested in debate, we run the Intel where we pose one question a week and get different responses on it to see what the debates are in the sector. I'm looking at a lot of people who have already written for the Intel, which is wonderful. Um, and the second platform that we've just launched is called The Pitch, and it is to do exactly what we've heard today, to put down ideas to complex development problems uh, and write them up in a way that is very easily accessible for government to implement them. So please do check it out. That is our website. Um, on to the winners. Yeah, yeah let's do it. Okay. So we're going to announce um, the top three, but I'll let Bridie. I'm not sorry, Bridie. <laughs> Bridie's over there, Maddie's here. I'm totally Maddie, got Maddie. it together, it's right. We're nearly there, oh, yes. we're nearly there. Okay. Alrighty. In third place is Bianca from Catalpa International. In second place is Ash Betteridge from Better Things Consulting. And in first place and taking home this very swanky trophy, is Raphael <laughs> I was going to invite <laughs> Congratulations, Raphael. I was going to invite you to do a non-jargonistic speech. Um, congratulations. Um, that was such a fun session and really an energetic way to wrap up the last two and a half days. I'm feeling jingly like I was at the very beginning. So I'd like to invite Anthony Mulakala from the Asia Foundation up. Um, we're just going to do a very for very quick closing session, but and the tales of that amazing session. Um, just to wrap up, this is the last session before drinks. So Minister Conroy yesterday, when he opened the session, alluded to the history of the Australasian Aid Conference. And he remarked that at the beginning, it started as a workshop, and he used those words. And he's in fact correct. And I recall when Stephen Howes and I were discussing the AAC, I think it was in 2013, he was very determined to keep it small, engaging, and workshop style. And the interest in that workshop um, in subsequent years has really surprised us. It developed a momentum of its own and grew to a point where we were absolutely bursting at the seams uh, in this facility. Um, we had at one point, I think the last session in 2019, 10 parallel sessions uh, or 10 parallel panels in each session. It, it was crazy. Um, and while we are a long way from the workshop aspiration 10 years ago, and despite the size of this event, in many ways, it still has that workshop feel. 
And it was wonderful to have a noticeable uptake, uptick in the diversity amongst our participants this year. And thank you all, all of you from different countries and different communities across our region for your invaluable inputs and also to those who helped to make this type of inclusion possible. And we really tried to mix it up this year with a combination of parallel sessions and varied plenaries, including the Mitchell Oration, which I think we all agree was uh, hugely powerful in challenging our assumptions and approaches to development policy and practice, the theatrical and hotly contested great debate, and our return to a conference favorite, the three-minute aid pitch, where Australian sarcasm still reigns. <laughs> And uh, for those of you who were lucky enough to secure a ticket to last night's uh, dinner conference, our conference dinner, uh, I think you will agree that the address by our keynote speaker on climate is development was paradigm shifting. And kudos to the new style of presenting the state of Australian aid. It was really gripping navel gazing. And I have always promoted this conference as the best development policy conference out there. And this year did not disappoint. This is really attributed to all of you as the participants. The quality of the discussion, the networking, the passion during the sessions, the breaks, and the drinks, um, really outstanding. And I love that so many of us know each other's names in such a large group, and we have really become a community. So lastly, we always can improve the Australasian Aid Conference, so please turn over your card and look at the link to the survey, and please give us your feedback. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Beth. <laughs> okay, so just in the absence of our director, Stephen Howes, I'm going to make those very important thank yous um, to the people that brought this conference together and, and made it happen. You, as the participants and as the audience, the presenters. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to go in a lot of sessions, so I was trying to read the vibe in, you know, when people are having breaks and meals. And there was, you know, even though there was some tough content in there, there was a lot of energy, a lot of positivity. There was one session in Acton where I looked in the window, people were sweating. <laughs> they were, I was like, I was going, oh my gosh, a and you functions are going to come and get me because there's too many people in the room and I was worried that, oh, well, they're not enjoying it. People came out of that room like they just had a, an epiphany. They were glowing, they were excited, and they were saying, I'm so glad you didn't drag us out. We had a really, such a fantastic session. So as someone who couldn't be in there, it was a, you know, that was the best feedback that we could have received. So thank you all. Sponsors, of course, um, this is a self-funded conference by the centre, so we really need the support of our sponsors. ACR, Australian Volunteers Program, Exemplar, DT Global, Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, Australia, Nathan, Simile, SMEC, and of course, Development Intelligence Lab. And our wonderful partners, the Asia Foundation. I'd like to thank Newcast, we set them an ambitious challenge of connecting three rooms, um, which I'd never done before, but it worked. So thank you so much for keeping our tech <laughs> happening. It really means that, you know, while this is an in-person conference primarily, we um, tried to connect people remotely as much as we could. Who is next? Okay, importantly, our team of casual staff, many of whom, as I mentioned, are students here at ANU or um, past students, I'm gonna name them. Kingtown Mambon, Shanice Espiritu, Moses David, Liam Cash, Yar Mulladen, and my colleagues, Evie Sharman and Sharon Liu. Thank you for holding the rooms together. <laughs> And last but not least, our events company of five <laughs> at the Development Policy Centre. Stephen Howes, who's hopefully high watching <laughs> on the live stream. Cameron Hill, who was the core, he's a relatively new staff member that um, brought the program together. Thanks, Cam. <laughs> Thank you.
Karen Downing, who's not here in the room, but she's doing all the comms, answering emails, um, doing all the program designing peripherals while editing the blog and publishing that every day while we're here. Thank you, Karen. And this very discreet, low-key, amazing, <laughs> I get emotional, yeah. <laughs> amazing, Aratika Okazaki. <laughs> who you have no idea how many hours he works. Lots in the lead up to this conference and is very calm, assured, and really he is a person that makes this conference happen. So thank you. So, yeah, um, I was excited, emotional, tired. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you for coming. And we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. And thank you, Beth, for everything you do. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Yeah, I should have done that.